All right, uh, my name is Brandon McHugh. Uh, I'm from West Central Iowa, a little town called Woodbine, um, probably north of Omaha and Council Bluffs area, about 40 miles. Um, I'm a sixth generation farmer, uh, mostly all no-till, a lot of corn on corn, um, have registered Red Angus, uh, and started growing birds for uh, Costco here in this last year, so that keeps me really busy too. Um, funny story about the, the herbicide resistant beans is I joined the army because I didn't want to walk beans anymore. That, that summer before I left for the army, I was walking beans and in the patches of sunflowers, there wasn't any beans left. I thought it was just dumb that we were doing it. But if we had the, uh, you know, we never even thought about using cover crops back then. And if we had them then, we probably wouldn't have been walking beans. But so it's kind of come back full circle if I hadn't went to the army and um, I probably wouldn't be here today. So, but in the army, I got to spend a lot of time in the desert. So that wasn't fun either. Um, so I was glad to be back and I was more of a cowboy when I come back so I started raising the registered Red Angus and um, unfortunately my dad passed away in 2006 and he was 56 years old and, and I kind of had to change my focus because the cows wasn't what was making the money. Um, but then after that I got to do everything my own way so, <laughs> uh, but I'd still love to have him back. Um, we started cover crops, um, uh, it's been a long time ago. I was trying to think of when it was, but we mainly just did it for cow feed. Uh, we just used an end gate seeder and um, we got to seeing the benefits of that. And then uh, we did that for a long time. Uh, mainly seeded it right after the silage came out. Um, oops, hit that button I wasn't supposed to. Uh, so, and right now my cover cropping systems is uh, do a lot of aerial just for lack of manpower and timing and um, do drill some and then um, I sell earlage to a, a local feed yard that uh, takes about 200 acres of uh, corn off every year. Early, so that kind of opens up the window to spread it, and I've been using a fertilizer spreader and, and just kind of tickle on the ground a little bit to, to get it to soil a little better. Um, we did probably close to 150 acres of aerial this year and I'm not sure, it's not looking the best so far. It was flowing on first part of September, had a couple of really good rains. And the only thing I could figure was maybe all the, the seed ended up in the, the plant itself. So hopefully it'll take off here for too long. Um, as far as reducing herbicides, um, I've been just, I try to do it pre-planting, you know, just spraying a glyphosate. Um, and then uh, cut out all the the pre-emerges and, and a lot of times, you know, if you hit it right, you don't even have to go back in for a post, but it it's kind of nice if you can uh, scout and figure out if you do need some. And that's a, you know, generic dual kind of, I throw in a little bit of that, you know, when I go to burn down, um, just for a little bit of, of uh, other chemistry. But it saves quite a bit. Um, glyphosate's pretty, well, before this year was really cheap, and <laughs> so it was a generic dual. And yeah, definitely uh, recommend but, uh, the scouting for post. Um, just a few ounces of generic Callisto works really good. Uh, and that's fairly fairly reasonably priced now too, but, but yeah, so I've cut out quite a bit. Um, 
And right now I'm kind of in my experimental stages too, um, using different legumes, um, trying a little bit of winter wheat to uh, maybe get rid of uh, a little bit of the nitrogen tie up. Um, uh, this is my, one of my first, this picture was, I don't know, it's maybe eight or 10 years old, but it was right outside the town of Woodbine and I'm sure everybody was shaking their head. Uh, everybody kind of at that point was doubting me anyway, I guess, so might as well make them really talk. Um, but that field just got uh, one pass of a uh, five pound uh, glyphosate of 38 ounces and then the, the generic dual. Um, I actually didn't spray anything else on it that year. Uh, it was really, I mean, it stayed pretty clean, really. Um, did that for three years in a row, corn on corn. Uh, and over here, a lot of the left of the picture, you can't see it, but the town's got uh, wells out there and they've got a high nitrate problem. So they was kind of, I found cost sharing to do, do that also. But right where I'm at there also is a, that field is really wet. A lot of times I don't even, in a wet year, I might not even raise a crop, but uh, I found out that, you know, after three years of that, it was really helping with the percolation, you know, down through the soil. Um, and I don't know, the land is a rented field and the, the landowner didn't want to tile it. And, and then, uh, well, it had a high cash rent gain came along and I lost it. So uh, I don't have that field anymore. But so in my experimental phases, I'm kind of going through. Um, I've done some research and found one of these rotary hoe looking thingies. I'm just kind of curious, has anybody had any experience with one of these? They work pretty good. Um, but I kind of like to, you know, find something like these old, the cultivator shields, something to concentrate the, um, maybe legumes with in between the rows. And that next year when you come back and plant in it, you know, you'll be planting into the cover crop. I'm trying to use some winter hardy type legumes and wheat mix maybe. Um, are you seeing, is it dying off before uh, the harvest? That was one of my main concerns, but. Um, so I don't know what you'd call that, but it's kind of a seed flinger. And, and then you could fashion it inside of a little spray hood, um, kind of concentrate the seed instead of going right in the row also. There's an old cultivator type shield that a person could fashion also. Uh, and there's some more of my uh, experimental type stuff. That was a pea and the oat mix I did just for some uh, baleage. I uh, probably let it get a little bit too, too much age on it, but baled it up and wrapped it in plastic and Makes beautiful feed. Um, I think would work really good, you know, to come back in with some soybeans also. Another picture of the, the peas and the oats. Uh, this is what I got uh, 220 acres of this year. Um, it's a wheat, tillage radish, winter pea, and balanza clover. Um, kind of evaluating it here the other day and I thought maybe I should have tried more pea or more wheat and peas and the radishes seem pretty prominent. Um, and I chose the balanza because they've got the higher, the highest seeds per pound. Um, and this is kind of my spreadsheet that I built to kind of help me figure out my costs and the seeding rates and um, so yeah, I kind of wish I'd have gone with a little more wheat and some, maybe some more peas. They're not as prominent, but they're supposed to be the winter hardy peas. And 
I think with that, it's just going to be really the type of winter we go through, uh, you know, to see how they fare through the winter. Um, but I'm kind of, I don't doubtful. We'll see how it goes, but. Um, And that was seeded after this picture right here was in some ground that we chopped corn off of. Um, and that was November 4th when that picture was taken. As of then, we had a few mornings down to 20 degrees and the, looks like the radishes were still doing okay. Um, and that was just here the other day. And you can kind of see some of the clovers coming in down in there. Um, I really wish I'd see more of them, but I, as time has gone on, it's you see more and more every day. And that's it for me. All right, so I'm Michael Vitito, uh, farm in Washington County. Uh, so we're down in the southeast corner of the state. Uh, I like to throw a picture like this in. Um, I think I found this on Twitter. But, uh, you know, this, this really kind of seems to echo with, with people. You know, when you first get started farming, you know, it's pretty easy to make mistakes that seem like pretty obvious ones. And then you get a little more comfortable, you start being able to do some tricks and stuff, but the rake ends up hitting you in the face anyways. So uh, a little bit about our operation. We're a multi-generation family farm. Uh, we run about 1,400 acres. Our row crops are mainly corn, soybeans, and cereal rye. Uh, Dad and Grandpa started no-tilling back in the 80s. So a lot of experience with conservation type stuff and, and you know, kind of pushing the envelope on uh, on what we're doing in the fields. Uh, we started using cover crops back in about 2012. Uh, last year was the first year we were 100% on every acre. Uh, every acre has been drilled again this fall. Um, primarily just doing cereal rye on our row crop acres. Uh, and then I've got, some, I've got about 40 head of cattle as well. So we're doing some diverse mixes in the, in the pasture for grazing. Uh, we also have some confinement hogs so we have access to hog manure and some resources as far as that goes. And then all of the beef that we're raising is all direct marketed. So uh, one of the things when you're starting to look at a system like this is you've got to have your own values that you're going to want to employ while you're making decisions on the farm. So for me, uh, I came back to the farm about seven years ago and I kind of had to figure out where my values were at. And... Uh, yeah, so that's kind of been a learning process. But this is, this is kind of where I have came to, I guess, in my journey um, is, you know, I think we can have a production agriculture system that is in sync with nature and it creates, you know, healthy ecosystem, which creates healthy crops and healthy livestock and then healthy humans. Because this little guy right here, I want him to be out there working with me and not worried about all the bad stuff that he could possibly get into, you know, and keep everybody healthy. Not only him, but everybody else's kids too. So, as part of this, you know, this is, we're trying to, we're trying to work with a natural system. So, you know, we got to learn what nature is telling us. You know, and this is, this is something that has been increasingly clear to me as we've gotten further down this path is, Nature is the only unbiased source of information in the world. Doesn't matter who you're getting it from, you can get information from me, you can get it from Sarah, you can get it from anybody that you trust, but that person's going to be biased. I have biases, Sarah has biases, everybody has biases. Nature does not have biases. And it's got millions of years of R&D under its belt. We just need to learn how to tap into it. So that's where we need to learn to read what nature is showing us through observation and interpretation, and then we can implement that on our operation. So once we start working with nature, we begin to solve problems instead of just treating symptoms. And weeds are symptoms, they're not problems. So uh, Klaus Martins is someone, I've never met the guy, but he's an organic farmer out in uh, New York State. 
And uh, I was watching a YouTube presentation that he put on the other day. And uh, this, was, this was a quote that he had. Cultural practices set you up for how many weeds germinate. There are triggers that either send weed seeds into deep dormancy or bring weed seeds out of deep dormancy in large numbers. So when we think about that, you know, what can we do as far as cultural practices to send those weed seeds into deep dormancy and keep them there and not bring them back up and keep them, uh, get them started again. We want to keep them in deep dormancy. So to do that, we have to implement the principles of soil health. You know, it starts with plant residue on the surface, minimizing the disturbance. Anytime we don't have residue on the surface or we disturb the soil, that's going to trigger weed seeds to start growing again. Uh, and then the more diversity in plant species we can have, the healthier the ecosystem is going to be, and it's just a, a snowballing effect. And then obviously the plant roots 24-7 keep something there. Uh, you know, if there's a living plant there, nature's not going to trigger weed seeds to, to germinate. Uh, and then the icing on top of the cake is the livestock integration, but we're not going to touch on that too terribly much. We've been talking about it already. Okay, so I have some examples here. These are all from our operation. Uh, none of these pictures have any herbicide applied to them, so this is all just, you know, this is what happens when you just let nature do whatever it's going to do. So this is a field that had cereal rye that was killed with a roller crimper and soybeans in it in 2019, and then this was in May of 2020. So you can see the rye residue, and then in the fall we had gone through and injected 4,000 gallons of hog manure into that field. Where's the weeds? Is there just more weed seeds right here in this strip than there is in between the strips? Or did we do something to trigger those weeds to grow? We did something. So, you know, there you go. There's your disturbance, and we added excess fertility to it. Boom, there's your trigger. There's your weeds. Here's another one. This was in 2020. Uh, cereal rye, killed it with a crimper. Got the beans coming up through it. This is a terrace. I was getting lazy when I was drilling the rye. Went out around it, didn't come back and hit the back slope of the terrace. And then look what we got. Nothing but weeds. Is there just more weed seeds that were there and no weeds there? I don't think so. No herbicide on any of that. Okay, here's another one. This one's really fun. So in 2020, we had a 60-inch corn, 60-30 corn plot, uh, and I was going to interseed it, but then I had Roundup-resistant water hemp come in, so I had to spray it with Callisto. Ended up not putting any cover crops in there. And then I waited till spring to put oats in, but I was lazy again, and I didn't calibrate the drill. I ran out of seed, so this area had no cover crop. So we just have our corn residue here, and then there wasn't any residue really in the middle of the 60 inch rows. Look where we have weeds. Look where we don't have weeds. Then I go over here where I've got my oats. Same scenario, still the 60 30 stuff. And this was just broadcast on with the spinner spreader, not incorporated, about March 1st. No weeds over here. Ran some cattle through that too. That's why the oats are kind of beat up. But just examples like this, you start letting nature show you when weeds are going to grow and you can start interpret that and figure it out and understand what makes it grow and what makes them not grow and plan your management accordingly. So with that, does anybody have any questions after seeing those slides? Before we're going to get into what our soybean program looked like for this year. Anybody have any questions right now? Or we can just keep rolling. Is it just the barrier that causes the weeds to come up? Well, it's a, it's a combination of things. In this, in this scenario, I mean, yeah, clearly it's, it's the lack. I, I think it goes back to those soil health principles, and you got to have two missing, it seems. You can kind of get away with one missing. But here, we didn't have any disturbance, but we didn't have any armor, and we didn't have any living roots. Right here, we had armor, but we didn't have any living roots. No disturbance, but there's so there's only one key missing. So there's not really any weeds there. You get the living root, no problems. So How are you gonna plant that? There's soybeans drilled in there. 
You can see them. There you can see them, drilled on an angle. So they're starting to come. That was when it was really hot and dry. And uh, I think they got drilled like June 12th after the cattle got off. Yeah. Why did you go to 60 inch rows and what's your benefits from it? Uh, well, the plan was to put cover crops in there. This is inside my pasture. So the plan was to have some better grazing. Uh, ended up not happening. Wish I would have done it, but that's, that was the goal with that. And also, in this exact scenario, we side dressed hog manure on the corn uh, after the corn was up. So that was another thing we were able to do with our tank set up, side dressed hog manure in, in season instead of putting it out 10 months before the crop needs to take it up and lose a whole bunch of it. So, <coughs> all right, we're gonna rock and roll. We're gonna keep going here. So I'm going to talk about kind of what we are doing, what we did this, this past growing season in 2021 for our soybean program. Uh, this is a pretty cool picture, but don't do that. That was a bad time. When you go drill in the snow, it works really good until it doesn't. And then it's not fun to clean your drill out once it starts plugging up. So it's a good picture, but yeah, don't do that. So everything, everything that I drill, is all on 10 inch row spacings, but I'm all, generally speaking, I'm always blocking off every third row unit to make 10 inch twin rows on 30 inch centers. So the X's represent the rows that are blocked off, and then you can see the corn stalks, the 30 inch row corn stalks, in between the row units that are planting. So I'm straddling the corn stalks with my two rye rows, and then not planting in the middle, and then that's where my beans are gonna go. So that's what the drill looks like. There's what the rye looks like in the spring. So this is the rye that was drilled into the snow. So it worked just fine until the drill plugged up. But the rye looks all right. That rye was drilled October 20th. Generally speaking, when we're using a program like what you're about to see, I like to put that rye in no earlier than about October 15th. Closer into late October and closer to November, the better. And I'll kind of show you why here in a second. So this rye was drilled in September, uh, September 24th. So this was actually five days before this. So five days later, the rye looked like this. This is what this rye looked like in March 26th. Same drilling rate, same everything. This is in tens, obviously. But look how much more tillering we have. And if you're feeding cattle and grazing it, that's fantastic. But what we're trying to do is a little bit different than that. So I want my rye to be a little more tame, not quite as aggressive. Look at that. That's when you got excess nitrogen, that rye plant's gonna take it up and it's gonna think it's a rabbit and it's just gonna throw tillers all over the place. So it gets pretty aggressive. And anytime you see that, I, I call it big nasty rye because it can get mean. That's where it can just drown stuff out and it can be a little bit of a challenge if you don't get on top of it. So here we are planting soybeans. This was extra early planting. Uh, we did a big planter project over the winter, so we wanted to get it out and shake it down. So we were out there April 5th, planting beans into the rye. Uh, did about 70 acres that day. Pulled out, waited, waited to plant more until April 23rd, 22nd in that neighborhood. So this is when we're getting ready to plant our relay beans where we're actually gonna harvest the rye. This is what it looked like. Everything was all set up the same, the 10 inch twin rows. Uh, so this is what the rye looked like when we were getting ready to plant it. There it is after the planter goes through. I think I had my row, cl row cleaners a little bit too aggressive uh, because I started getting some soil splashing and whatnot on the beans, uh, causing some diseases and whatnot on the lower leaves of the beans. So here's the beans coming up. We have not sprayed anything yet. So May 13th, didn't spray anything. Uh, right around that June 11th was when we would have gone in and hit everything with 22 ounces of Roundup just to kill the rye. So, the next thing we did, build this roller. So, I call this Unobtainium Customs because I built it and I'm not going to build another one. So, you can't buy one of these unless you buy this one. It is for sale. But, uh, anyways, so I built this in row roller to be able to lay this rye down in between the 30 inch rows uh, to just get it out of the way, give the beans full sunlight, 
create that thatch on the ground instead of just leaving the rye standing. Uh, kind of just stumbled into this practice. Like I lucked into finding these rolling baskets on Ag Talk for sale for cheap and I bought them and it's like, well, I gotta make something happen now. So built this roller. This is what it looked like when we were out rolling. So the rye had already been sprayed. So it, you know, it's already knocked in the head. It's starting to turn brown and whatnot. And uh, then you go in and, and roll it down and it, it gives the beans full sunlight and creates that thatch. This is another scenario where we did not kill the rye with the, with the herbicide. This was in part of our relay cropping trial with Theo and the Soybean Association. I did not want to spray the rye, have a little bit of drift, get into our relay stuff that we're going to harvest because a little fart of Roundup will kill the heads and you're not going to have very much yield on the outside of your strips. So we wanted to avoid that and I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to just figure out how to kill the stuff with my in-row roller. So I waited till dough stage, rolled this rye down, no herbicide. I had to roll it twice. I had to roll each row individually with my baskets because they're not wide enough. Um, but we're working on upgrading our roller for next year to be able to kill it in one pass. But notice how, notice how the rye is spread out a lot more all the way between the 30 inch rows. I think that's an important thing. You look back at this and I've got these little angle irons that gather the rye into the basket to funnel everything in there. And then it, it kind of concentrates it in a little 10 inch band in the middle. And I've got a, a pretty wide area that doesn't have any residue on the top. And the soil gets a lot warmer there. And, and uh, we, you know, we kind of lose, lose some of that thatch benefit that we get when we've got a better full coverage like we do here. Okay, so here, here's some of the, the disease I was talking about from the row cleaners and soil splashing and whatnot. I mean, these beans were planted early. We had quite a bit of rain this spring uh, when these beans were small. So that's what some of that is. I think if I picked my row cleaners up a little bit more, made them a little bit less aggressive, I could probably avoid some of that. Um, so this is some of the, this is what the beans look like. Uh, they were growing really slow early on. These are enlist beans. They were growing really slow early on, but they've, they finally kind of picked up. These would be some of the relay beans over here. So here's, here's a comparison of in-row rolled beans versus not rolled beans. The left is not rolled, the right is rolled. Um, notice how closer together the nodes are on these beans that were rolled. And then we start to have some, we have some branches starting down here at the bottom. That's a big deal. We're getting those branches started way earlier and we're gonna have those going off and filling in our 30 inch rows instead of those bean plants reaching for the sky and throwing a bunch of pods up heavy. Makes those beans lodge once we get some winds in August. So there's another picture, July 4th, uh, the rolled beans, still no herbicide applied, zero herbicide, not very many weeds. I don't see any really. Um, so they're starting to come on. So we're gonna kinda talk about the relay beans a little bit now. This is kinda getting into the relay harvest window. So the whole concept is plant the beans early, have the rye out there, harvest the rye, beans take over, et cetera, et cetera. We kinda learned about it earlier today. Uh, so this is our program with it. Uh, the rye is getting close to maturity here. You can kind of see what the beans look like. This is what it looked like when we were out there harvesting. It's just an old 2166 with a 25 foot 1020 head on it. Uh, we had a three inch rain come through right before the rye was ready to harvest and it got everything all tangled up and lodged and whatnot. So I built some poly little sickle guard deals to block off the bean area and try and get the head a little bit lower to hopefully get as many of these rye heads as I could that are broke off and kind of laying all over the place. Um, but yeah, you can see what it looked like before the combine and after the combine. July 20th. So here it is a couple days after harvest, beans starting to take over. Uh, we hadn't had a rain yet at this point. Seems like once they get a rain on them after harvest, they really start to crank. Um, but that was a struggle at that time of year for us in our neighborhood. So this is some of the chemically terminated rye that was then rolled. Um, so again, this would have had a post pass on it by now to clean up any escapes. There's, there's really not much weed pressure out there, but we have just enough little bit of water hemp kind of in the area that got disturbed by the row cleaners and, and whatnot away from the thatch that we had to just justify going in there and hitting it with the post pass of herbicide. But we're clean now, filling the rows in. Here's comparison of the relay 
versus the no relay or the, the non relay. This is where we killed the rye with the crimper instead of spraying it. So there's the two side by side. There's the beans starting to fill. Uh, pull the bean canopy back. Look at that thatch that we still have there. So that, that whole area is shaded. Beans are completely canopied. They close the 30 inch rows. It's 90 some degrees out there that day. Uh, pull everything back. Everything had been in the shade. It's not like we had sun in there. Put your hand on the ground right below the bean plant where there was not a rye residue. And that ground is warm to the touch, you know, warmer than ambient temperature. Stick your hand underneath that rye residue, six inches away from it, and it's cool to the touch. Just that insulation keeps that soil cooler. It's keeping that soil cooler keeps your biology functioning all the way through the summer. It keeps things, just keeps the whole system working the way we need it to. See the branching? We've got about four branches coming off of that main stem at the bottom. That's what we're able to get when we use the roller versus not rolling the rye. There's side by side of the trial again, getting a little closer. September 2nd, still super green. I should say these, these are 3.6 maturity beans uh, planted in April. 3.6 is definitely kind of pushing it in our area. Normally 3.4 is about the upper limit. Um, using a system like this, fuller season beans are gonna work better. Here's what it looked like where I did not roll the rye down. I sprayed it to kill it and then didn't roll it so I could have a trial to see what the roller did and what it didn't do. Right here is about 15 bushel difference. Across the strips that I had, it ended up probably averaging right around seven bushel uh, yield hit where I did not roll the rye. So I had three strips. I only really needed one to figure out that I needed to roll it. But hey, I had three strips because you're supposed to replicate stuff, right? But that's what it looked like. And, that, and you can see, you know, those beans got up above that rye and then they threw a whole bunch of pods up there. And then we got a wind in August and everything just kind of laid down. But then you go right next door where it was rolled, there's no lodge beans at all. So here we go. This is the relay beans when we're getting close to harvest. Uh, they never really got above the rye straw like I was hoping. And I really thought they looked pretty, pretty terrible. I was very, very concerned going into harvest, thinking that they were going to be not good compared to the compared to the monocrop beans. So you can see what they look like. This is actually a better part of the field. But uh, then here we are. This is, this is the, the rolled beans next to the relay beans. And when I was doing my post pass here, I ran out of herbicide with just this little bit to go. Decided, well, there doesn't look like there's too terribly many weeds there. I'm just going to skip it. So there's no herbicide all season long in that strip, just rolled dry. Yeah, we've got some escapes. There's some water hemp. For the most part, what you see there is volunteer corn. Um, this area grew like 270 bushel corn the previous year, so there's going to be some corn on the ground after a crop like that. But, you know, that's, that's the type of thing that's possible once we start utilizing a system like this. Uh, these beans averaged about 80 bushel right through here. So 80 bushel beans, no herbicide, no tillage, and not a lot of weeds. The relay beans ended up doing about 63 right next door. So, okay, now we're going to break down some cost stuff. I know we like to look at numbers. So this is an example of a weed control program that you'd be using if you weren't using a cover crop. Uh, you know, you got your burn down pass early, $30. I don't know, that might be a little bit cheap. I'm not sure what prices are going to be like next year. But uh, burn down, post pass, and then possibly a second post pass, depending on what weed pressure is. So $65 to $85. Uh, like I said, this is based on 21 pricing. 22 is going to be higher. Just how much? I don't know. Um, but the thing to think about with the program like this, the majority of these costs are dollars that are getting sent off the farm to chemical companies. You're not getting those dollars back. There's no way you're going to get them back. They're gone. You know, and we're spending dollars to treat symptoms. We're not solving any problems. If herbicide solved problems, we wouldn't have weeds anymore but we still have weeds, so it's just a symptom treatment. So then once we start using rye, this is pretty close to what our system was this year. Um, $30 to get a rye cover crop established. I think, I think about everybody can do that, even if you, know, you want to hire everything done and pay full retail for seed. I think that's a reasonable dollar amount to throw at it. Um, 
to burn that down, you know, if you're just using Roundup, I think you can get that done for about 12 bucks. Uh, might be a little bit more this next year. And then the in-row roller, which would be optional, is another 15. And then a post pass is 25. So without the in-row roller, we're talking 67, including the, the whole cost of the rye. So 67, add the in-row roller in, it's 82. And like I said, the in-row roller added about six, seven bushels to our beans. So, you know, it paid for itself as far as that goes. Um, but then in this situation, we have very little weed pressure to clean up in the post pass. So, you know, we saw that picture that I just showed. Can we figure out how to clean up that last little bit and not have to spray a post, uh, a post spray for 25 bucks? Can we hit it with the roller again and clean up most of that? You know, can we hire some high school kids? I don't know. But I think we can get creative and figure out a way to get rid of that post pass. Um, and then with this type of scenario, the majority of these dollars that we're spending are potentially generated on the farm, whether it be through, you know, if you're growing your own rye seed, if you're running your own drill, uh, if you've got your own roller, you know, those can be profit centers for your farm operation instead of just sending those dollars out to the chemical companies. Um, but yeah, there's lots of room for improvement in this as well. So then, this is what I'm looking at for next year, upgrading the roller so I can eliminate that burn down pass. So that cuts $12 off. So now we're talking about $45 of mechanical control with the cover crop in there. And then the post pass is $25. Can we cut that $25 out? Can we cut it down? I think we can do something with it. Not exactly sure yet. Um, but that's just, you know, we're spending dollars to actually solve problems. And generally speaking, the dollars are, we're spending the dollars with ourselves, you know, with our own business instead of sending it off the farm. So then, you know, we get into the relay type scenario where you're, this is what I really like because our weed control program is a revenue source. It's not an expense, it's a revenue source. So the rye costs money, a little bit more, throw some fertilizer, maybe throw some fungicide at it, just to make sure you get good germ. I learned the lesson the hard way on that this year, long story. Uh, rye harvest, post-harvest herbicide, gets us up to $150, $155 of expense. Uh, rye revenue, call it 30 bushels, $7 in the field, because you got a truck at home, put it in a bin, put air on it, get it back out, get it cleaned, and then you can finally sell it a seed. So $7 in the field is what I throw at it, gets us $210 an acre of revenue. So our profit from our weed control program is $55. That's profit. That's not an expense like what we have here. So $55 acre profit, and then on top of that, you're not spending the $65 to $85 for the expenses and the non-relay programs. So you're talking about $120 to $140 differential between the two as far as your, your dollars per acre uh, that you're working with. Now, soybean yield is going to be the deciding factor in how that ends up playing out uh, with our profitability. If we do a good job with our relay soybeans, I think we can get really close to matching our soybean yields with our monocrop beans. But, you know, we're not there yet. We've only done it two years, got just over 100 acres under our belt. I know there's guys that have been doing it a lot longer, that their relay beans are just as good as what their monocrop beans are. You know, so the potential's there and we can have better overall profitability. So, just to kind of wrap it up, you know, the whole premise of doing the system like this is, you know, we're trying to do this. You know, we want to get, we want to get our, our farm to start being a functional natural ecosystem again, because believe it or not, all of our farms are natural ecosystems. They're just not used to being functional anymore because of everything that's happened for the last however many years. Um, so anyways, this is, you know, having goals like this, if your only goal is, you know, to grow a crop and then go hang out at the lake, you know, it might be a difficult time to get a system like this implemented, but it is possible and we can make this happen as a profitable way of doing about it, going about it. So with that, open it up for questions. Brandon, why don't you come? You got to come back up here. <laughs> we have questions. Questions? <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Oh. Can you talk a little bit about uh, any differences you'd use in selecting your soybeans that you used for this? You mentioned you went to a later bean. Did you up your population? Did you look for any different characteristics of the beans? Were you more concerned about white mold with some of the mat on the ground? What were some of the things that you had learnings there and would you choose any other traits going forward based on your experience? Sure, so on the, on the bean selection, um, I guess what we found this was, these are Enlist beans. Enlist is a new platform. We had it uh, two years ago as well. The bean that we used here was just the best bean that we had the previous year. Um, you know, best yielding bean that we had. It does do pretty good at bushing. So, you know, that was a, that was a factor in it as well in the full season aspect of it. Um, but as far as like white mold is concerned, we don't really have a lot of white mold pressure in our area. Um, so that's not a big thing that I'm considering. Uh, one of the things I did consider with this is the population and the fact that we're starting to push our, pop, our planting day earlier and earlier, I've actually lowered my populations down because I don't want those beans to have as much in row competition for sunlight and grow up tall and start lodging and whatnot. So standability is a concern when you start pushing your planting day earlier with the full season beans because they'll just keep stacking nodes and get taller, taller, taller if they don't have the room to run. So that was, that was something that we did. These were dropped at about 120,000 in 30 inch rows. Normally we would be 130 to 140 depending on when we're planting. The later in the year you start dropping more. So I think we can cut our pops back even more than what we did, but yeah. Brandon, what about you on population or seed varieties? Um, oh, my corn, we've been lowering it some. We're back down to around 32 to 34,000. Um, and what beans we do plant, we've kind of pushed them back some too. We're probably, we plant our beans in 15 inch rows, what little we have, and we're probably down around um, 120, 130. We do some testing and, you know, to, at 110 to up towards 170. and. Uh, just don't really see much difference, I guess. So try to save money with seed costs. Tell us about any seed treatments or biostimulants or anything like that that you guys are using. Uh, I guess as far as seed treatments go, we're just using the standard stuff. You know, these are treated beans. Uh, I'd like to start cutting back on some of the treatments that we're using, but I guess when you're starting to cut your population back and you're planting them that early, kind of get a little nervous about, you know, not having treated beans out there and having them get sick and die. But I think the rye is going to do as good of a job as anything at keeping those beans healthy uh, early on by keeping the soil a little bit, uh, you know, better aggregated and not just sitting there with water ponded on it all year. So I think we can start cutting some of that stuff back. Um, you know, so seed treatments, everything's pretty much just the same. And then the only thing that we're really doing, you know, that is kind of new for us anyways, is we've started doing some foliar types, type uh, spray passes late in the season on these beans. So like R4, R5, uh, you know, that neighborhood, we're going out there and doing a foliar feed pass. So whether or not we're executing that properly yet, I don't know. Um, didn't really have good check strips this year, but you know, where we were doing it, and we were using uh, using these these this good variety of beans, and we had the beans planted early. We had some of the best beans we've ever grown. So, you know, I'll take it. I think I think that's one of the biggest things growing in this industry right now is you know the uh, soil microbes, and it's probably one of the most important thing that we have for us. You know, is the living organisms in the soil, and there are, we've been experimenting with different products. Um, one of the companies, Biodyne, that we've been using on uh, in furrow and and foiler, um, seen quite a response. Uh, and they've also got a product called Respite too that helps uh, inhibit the ethylene glycol that production when the plant gets stressed. Um, but a lot of it comes back to the the bacteria, the soil, and you know introducing good bacteria, I guess. And, 
And uh, I think that's going to be pretty important here, you know, coming up, try to save. I mean, we can save on our P and K application, probably make a lot of those nutrients more available in the soil that aren't, you know, instead of spreading the, uh, the process fertilizers, I guess. Um, Brandon, what were, your, what were the planting and harvesting dates for the oat pea mix? And can you comment about the key learnings from using that mix? I'm sorry, what was that last part? Can you comment about the, your learnings from using the oat pea mix? Oh, oh. Um, Thank you. Well, the, the oats and peas, I planted as early as I could. Um, I'm trying to remember dates. I sh of course, I should have had that, but <laughs> I believe it was actually uh, towards the end of March. Um, and then it was harvested uh, middle of June. And I'm going to come back and see what, I uh, actually want to see if, you know, what maybe the nitrogen value of the peas left behind. Um, so I'll probably try to, uh, you know, discount my nitrogen application some, experiment with different areas. Um, so I don't know if I've really learned anything yet, but. <laughs> Just trying to learn, I guess. Make, it makes great feed, though. I mean, that the cows love it. Michael, can you talk about how you're upgrading? You mentioned you're going to upgrade the in-roll roller, mm -hmm. like, or redo it. What are you doing for next year? So yeah, Lydia is asking, what are we doing with the in-roll roller? Um, so I guess, long story short. The roller that I built, you know, is homemade, is kind of a light duty deal. Good enough to learn kind of how some of the stuff works with it. Um, but I guess we're comfortable enough with it now that we're making the investment to go buy the Dawn and real rollers and build a toolbar, a 40 foot toolbar, uh, you know, purpose built for doing some of this stuff. And, and hopefully we can build some flexibility into it, you know, possibly put like a liquid system on it to feed the soybeans while we're going across it. And, and do some stuff like that. Um, so that's kind of you know that's kind of where my head's at, and is get the rye killed mechanically, not spray a chemical on it. Hopefully feed the beans while we're going across the field, and and get them off to the best start that we can once we take that rye cover off. So. And a quick follow up: Are you set on in roll, or would you ever just get a straight roller crimper where you're not doing the between rows? I. I, she was asking if, if I was set on using the in-row roller versus a full-width roller. Um, I don't have anything against using a full-width roller, but I think the flexibility that you get by having the in-row roller, um, you know, I can go across the field, those beans can be flowering, you know, they can have pods on them as long as I'm not running the beans over, uh, you know, down the row. They don't know that I'm going across it, really. So. Just the flexibility and timing, you know, being able to go later, plant your beans earlier. Uh, you know, I, I have used a full width roller, rolling rye with beans emerged. And uh, yeah, you go out and look behind the roller and see what the beans look like, and it's a terrifying experience. They ended up doing just fine, but I did about two rounds, and I'm like, yeah, that's about enough of that, just because it did not look good. But they, I mean, they ended up doing fine. So I know it can happen, but, you know, I guess I would just rather not be rolling the beans over while I'm at it, so. What percentage of your uh, total beans are you rolling right now? And uh, do you have plan B if uh, you can't roll? Uh, I mean, we had, we had everything got rolled this year. So, uh, you know, I guess with the, end, with the end row roller, you know, you've got a lot of flexibility. Chances are, most likely, at some point during the year, you're going to be able to get across it. So, you know, plan Plan B would be, you know, the only thing I would have considered as a Plan B would be watching the weather in the spring. And if we're super dry, like certain parts of the state was this year, you know, then we're going to go hit it with the sprayer, you know, kind of like what we've always done in the past. And most likely, if we're killing it that early for moisture concerns, we're not going to need to go roll it because it's not going to be crazy, you know, six foot tall rye that we need to manage. So. Other questions for Have you ever had a 
you have thought about trying to relay something else in between beams? Like, the question was, have we thought about trying to relay something else in between beans? You're talking after the rye harvest? Uh, I know Warren Steinloggy uh, up in northeast Iowa, he, he went in and put buckwheat in after his rye harvest and then harvested the buckwheat with the soybeans and then just cleaned it out. Uh, I know he says it worked great. I don't know if he's done it since then, but, you know, I think there's possibilities there. It's just a matter of, you know, creating logistical challenges uh, you know, as far as separating that seed and whatnot, you know, that's another step that you have to do. You know, I kind of sound like a talking out of both sides of my mouth because we're going out and drilling rye in the fall when we got all the harvest stuff to do and whatnot. And that, you know, labor can be a concern there, but we've made it a priority. You know, I think I, I think if you can get a system working with something like buckwheat, you know, it's there for the taking. It's just a matter of figuring out how to make it work on your operation. So. Someone had a question about sorghum sedan earlier. That's what is in this picture, right? There. Sorghum sedan drilled in, when was that? Mid, middle of June sometime uh, after cereal rye. So grazed the rye three times, I think. Eventually it just kind of got too big. Drilled the warm season mix. No fertilizer, this is what it looked like. I think that would have been late August probably, first time across it. And then we got another grazing pass after that with the regrowth. So the cows like the sorghum sedan and it makes good beef. Did you kill the rye on, on this before you drilled it? Just the cattle and the drill, it's the only thing I did. So now there's a little bit of volunteer rye starting to come up this fall, but I wish there was more, because then I wouldn't have to run the drill across it again, but. Are these pairs? Uh, I, just, I run everything together. So there's finisher animals, pairs, yearlings, everything but the bull right in this picture. Well, there's about 40 head in there. You're grass-fed beef, right? I don't necessarily call it grass fed anymore because sometimes the sorghum sedan will put a seed head on and they'll get some grain with that. So I just call it pasture raised and I mean I direct market everything so you know it is what it is. People like it and that's all that matters I guess. Does wheat suppression vary as you move up in the number of pounds of rye? Does wheat suppression vary as you move your rye seeding rate up. Uh, I guess my experience is not like just a little bit of rye gets you a lot of weed suppression. It's just a matter of how hard you're trying to leverage it and what what weed pressure you have in your fields. You know, if you have a lot of uh, winter annual broadleaf pressure like mare's tail and whatnot, I would think you would want to have a really dense stand to shade that stuff out. Uh, but if you don't have much winter annual pressure, a light stand of rye is going to keep weeds from germinating in the spring. And that rye is, you know, it's there. Stuff's not going to be able to compete with it. So a light stand does a really good job with spring germinating weeds, but the fall germinating stuff is where the trick's at. I've never, I mean, besides my um, experimentation here this year, you know, with the wheat and um, seeing I'd li like a little more cover than that. I I just usually don't uh, change my populations too much, I guess, with my rye. But I would think that more the better if you're dealing with noxious weeds. Yeah. 